Cyril, where is... I'm sorry, it has changed position. Why has it changed? Okay, good morning. Uh, we'll begin. Um, so we've been looking at the historical books. We looked at Samuel and Kings. Uh, we were not able to cover most of the stories which are there, but at least we got a brief overview of those historical books. So today we will look at Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. These are the three books that we will be covering today. So. Uh, Chronicles has the same uh, events mentioned uh, because the same kings are being discussed. So in, in uh, the book of Kings and in the book of Chronicles, it talks about the same kings. But the perspective from which it talks about the kings is different. Um, in first and second kings, it's more the history of those kings. It talks about uh, what they did the wars they waged. Whereas in Chronicles, the focus is more on the religious aspect. What were the kings like? Were they followers of the Lord? Were they faithful? Or were they evil and idolaters? So um, in Chronicles, the focus is more on the religious history. Whereas in First and Second Kings, it's more uh, to do with the political scenario. All right, so that's the main difference between um, uh, Kings and Chronicles. Uh, and First Chronicles mainly focuses on the events which are mentioned in uh, Second Samuel. Second Chronicles, on the other hand, uh, focuses more on First Kings and Second Kings, whatever is their uh, matter in that. So that uh, that is more the focus. Let's very briefly look at the structure of First Chronicles. Uh, we can divide First Chronicles into two main sections. Uh, chapters 1 to 9 uh, have a list of genealogies. The entire nine chapters are covering different genealogies uh, of, all the de of, of all the 12 tribes. And then you have the genealogy of King David. And you also have the uh, Levites uh, genealogy. All that is covered in First Chronicles chapters 1 to 9. Now chapters 10 to 29 is where uh, there's a more emphasis on David, uh, the preparations that he made for the temple uh, and all of that. So that is more the focus in chapters 10 to 29. Now, um, why was Chronicles written? I mean, they already have a history of the kings they have first kings and second kings so why where was the need for them to write chronicles so chronicles was actually written to encourage the people who came back from exile from babylon so this was uh, written much later first kings and second kings was written at an earlier time period whereas chronicles was mainly written to encourage the people who have come back from the period of exile um, now when the babylonians conquered you know jerusalem and they took the people away as slaves uh, to babylon from there the jewish people scattered to many other regions as well uh, they didn't stay or no, not everyone st continued to live only in babylon they spread out to other regions such as elam persia egypt and certain portions of Asia Minor. So the Jewish community spread out throughout the entire region. And for 70 years, the exile lasted. And then at the end of 70 years, when 
uh, you know, Cyrus gives the proclamation saying those who want to return back to their homelands, they can do so. At that point of time, uh, you have some of the Jews coming back. Many of the Jews were now very, very comfortable, very well established, you know, in these foreign nations where they have shifted. Because God told them that when they, when they are living over there, he will look after them, he will provide for them, he will bless them. And just as he promised, he took care of them, even during that entire time of exile. In fact, he took care of them so well that now the people are so comfortable living in those foreign lands that not many of them are willing to even come back to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is not um, the kind of well-established uh, city that it used to be earlier. It's in a broken down state. It's not very uh, popular. So not many of the Jews were, in fact, even uh, ready to come back. And those few, the faithful few who came back to the land were very discouraged to see the, the condition to which they had been reduced. Earlier, they had their own kingdom. They had their own king. They had their own independence and identity. And now they are just... Uh, you know, uh, uh, a bunch of exiles who have come back and there's no glory, you know, in Jerusalem awaiting them. So at this time, Chronicles was written to remind them of how God worked in their past history. They were good kings, they were bad kings, but the Lord had a plan. Whether things were, uh, whether the person on the throne was good or not, the Lord was continuously at work in the background to fulfill his purposes. So Chronicles was like a reminder to the people of what God had done for them in the past and what he can do for them once again, you know, now that they have come back. So it was meant to encourage them. It was also meant to emphasize that uh, the evil kings, they did not really prosper. It was the good kings, you know, that God lifted up, that he established. So these were all spiritual lessons that were being conveyed to the returned people through the uh, book of Chronicles. So um, we need to look at this particular book, you know, through that perspective, that it was meant to encourage them. It was also meant to teach them the importance of spiritual values. Um, Second Chronicles, uh, like I said, uh, talks more about events which took place during the time of first and second kings. Um, and it doesn't really talk much about the northern kingdom of Israel at all, because most of the exiles who came back to Jerusalem, they are all from the tribe of Judah. Because it's after all the Judah, people of Judah, right, who were taken away as slaves to Babylon. So um, it, the focus in Chronicles is mainly upon the southern kingdom, not so much on the northern kingdom. Um, and uh, so Second Chronicles can be divided again into two, uh, two sections. Chapters 1 to 9 uh, focus on the rule of King Solomon. Uh, it talks about his wisdom. Uh, it talks about the construction of the temple. Uh, it talks about all the other building projects that he had. Those are the things covered in chapters 1 to 9. Chapters 10 to 36, on the other hand, um, talk more about the things which took place after the you know uh, nation got split into two. So uh, in chapters 10 to 36, it talks about the 20 kings of Judah and how they ruled and uh, what they did and all of that. And also in uh, the second portion of uh, of Second Chronicles, there are five revivals mentioned. There were five kings who made an effort to um, talk to the people about how they should come back to God, how they should be faithful to the Lord. So uh, there are five revivals, spiritual revivals mentioned in the second portion of Second Chronicles. Um, so that would be under the rule of Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, uh, Hezekiah, and Josiah. These were the five kings who took the effort to try and bring about a spiritual revival among the people so that, you know, uh, the Lord would be honored. 
so this are this is just the basic structure of first chronicles and second chronicles now coming to some of the details which we can see in um, in uh, chronicles uh, in second chronicles chapter 11 it talks about some of the um, you know the the stand taken by some of the northern israelites maybe we can actually read out that and then we will discuss it very briefly second chronicles chapter 11 verses 13 to 16 if someone can read out second chronicles 11 13 to 16 can i read pastor go ahead but all the priests and Levites living among the northern tribes of Israel sided with Rehoboam. The Levites even abandoned their pasture lands and property and moved to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons would not allow them to serve the Lord as priests. Jeroboam appointed his own priests to serve at the pagan shrines where they worshipped the goat and calf idols he had made. From all the tribes of Israel, those who sincerely wanted to worship the Lord, the God of Israel, from the Levites to Jerusalem, where they could offer sacrifices to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Okay, so um, in Chronicles, it's talking about the history of the kings, the things which took place. So here in Second Chronicles, in this particular passage, it's talking about what happened after the kingdom was divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Last class, we saw how Jeroboam, because he was so insecure in God, he did not believe that the Lord would keep his promises towards him. And so he therefore deliberately leads the people into idol worship. He, uh, you know, he sets up calves, uh, golden calves in two places, and he teaches the people to start following idol worship so that they will not go to Jerusalem, so that they will not turn away from him. Uh, so, um, you know, he uh, Jeroboam brings in idolatry. And this is the response of the godly people in the northern kingdom when this terrible thing happens. We see here, it says that the priests and Levites from all their districts throughout Israel, they decide we cannot live in a place like this. Jeroboam is asking us to become priests of the pagan customs which he is introducing. So it is better for us to leave this northern kingdom and go and live in the southern kingdom. Now, this may seem like a small decision, but think about the details. The Levites did not have land of their own. They were never given territory of their own. They were given certain cities in each of the tribes where they were supposed to live and then you know they would be paid uh, um, you know in the in the in the in the form of um, props and uh, property and things like that for their services so now if they are saying that they're going to leave the northern kingdom and move to the south they are not going to have any territory which they can call their own they're not going to have anyone supporting them, backing them up. They're basically going to be completely on their own if they come to the southern kingdom. But yet, they choose to make that choice. Um, it says here in verse 14, 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 14, the Levites even abandoned their pasture lands and property and came to Judah and Jerusalem um, because they did not want to follow the, the pagan practices which Jeroboam had introduced. So here were a people who were willing to give up even their property and they came over here with their families, with their cattle, not knowing who's going to support them, not knowing how they're going to you know, provide for themselves. But they came to the south, southern kingdom uh, because as I mean, you, can, you can almost say like as if they were refugees. They came over here because they were committed to the living God and they wanted to stay in a place where the true God is being worshipped. It shows the great commitment of this people. And then the other godly people in the northern kingdom, when they saw what these priests and Levites were doing, they were so inspired by this example that it says in verse 
16, those from every tribe of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord, they also chose to leave the northern kingdom and come over here and settle down over here in the southern kingdom. So these are all people who made sacrifices to honor God. You know, so this is the lesson that we can learn from them. Even though they would not be having steady income, you know, if they leave their own land and come over here, they were willing to make that sacrifice so that because here they would have the freedom to worship Yahweh in the, in the correct manner, in the way that he has prescribed. Because over there in the northern kingdom, Jeroboam is introducing all kinds of pagan customs and they did not want to be part of that. Are we willing to make sacrifices to that extent and, you know, even give up our source of income and our land and property to be uh, committed and to remain loyal to the living God? So the commitment that these people made is indeed something, you know, to be admired and appreciated. Um, another thing that maybe we can look at from um, Second Chronicles is the contrast that we can actually draw between two of the kings. Uh, one is Joash and the other one is Josiah. Now, um, when we were looking at first and second kings, we just, you know, I just said in a couple of sentences that one of the important kings who is talked about in uh, kings is Ahab. Uh, but then, you know, we had no time to even um, go into any details regarding Ahab. Um, but it helps to know a little bit about that background, uh, you know, from Kings to understand some of the events which are mentioned over here in Chronicles. So we'll spend a little time looking at Ahab, who he was, uh, what exactly, you know, was his past background. And based on that, we will come into the story of Joash. And then uh, later on, we'll also if there is, if time permits, we'll also look at the story of Josiah. Um, so to look at a little bit of background, so this background information is found in Kings, not in, um, in Chronicles, but we are looking at this background to better understand the events which are mentioned later on in Chronicles. So um, in Second Kings, the first few chapters is where we get details about Ahab. We get to know that in the northern kingdom, uh, Ahab was the one who was ruling and he had chosen to marry a pagan wife, uh, you know, Jezebel. So Ahab and Jezebel were not interested in honoring God. They were evil. On the other hand, in the southern kingdom, in Judah, you had a godly king, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat truly loved the Lord, honored the Lord, but he made a very serious mistake, which in fact led to the uh, destruction of many generations. His one mistake, his one wrong decision, not only affected him and his immediate family, it even affected future generations. So even though we may be godly, even though we may love the Lord, sometimes the decisions that we take, you know, so lightly we take those decisions, it can affect entire generations. So this man, Jehoshaphat, who is a godly person, he decides to enter into a political alliance with the northern kingdom, with Ahab. I mean, it's the most foolish decision a person can make. Ahab has no respect for the Lord, no honor for the Lord. And here is a godly man saying, I'm going to make an alliance with this other kingdom. And that is why in the New Testament, we are very clearly warned and told, do not yoke yourself with unbelievers. If we form partnerships with them, it may cause us to you know, uh, go into wrong things which are against the Lord. So. Um, here we see Jehoshaphat doing this. He chooses to enter into an alliance with Ahab. And the idea is that he will give um, um, you know, Jehoshaphat's son, the, the crown prince, the one who is going to climb onto the throne, he is going to marry 
somebody from you know ahab's family that is the decision so we see that jehoram the crown prince of juda he marries ahab's daughter whose name is atalaya and atalaya's story is later on covered in uh, chronicles all right so um, now ahab and jezebel had no respect for the lord so you can imagine what their daughter must have been like atalaya had absolutely no godly values and a person like this marries jehoram and that is when you know the backsliding and the destruction and the downfall starts so um, jehoram marries atalaya and then he also jehoshaphat also has one more son named jehu jehu decides to leave his own southern kingdom and he decides to go and become a commander in ahab's army so uh, so you also you see not only have a marriage alliance you also have a kind of military alliance being formed where the, the next son jehu he chooses to go to the northern kingdom and become a commander in ahab's army and um, so we see in second kings chapter 9 um, maybe verse 14 onwards in uh, we get to know that elisha comes to jehu jehu is not a godly person he has no real interest in the things of god but you know um, god decides to use him as an instrument of judgment and so elisha comes to jehu and this is what uh, elisha says to jehu uh, he says if you are willing to destroy ahab's family and bring judgment upon them then god is willing to make you the king of israel even though you're from the southern kingdom even though you're from juda even though you have only come over here to be a commander in ahab's army i will god says i will make you to the king of uh, of northern of the northern kingdom if you are willing to destroy ahab's family jehu is more than willing to do that and so we see that jehu he uh, you know he assassinates the king who is there in the northern kingdom uh, that is actually one of the you know sons of ahab so he he kills him and then he also kills uh, you know his brother who is um, jehoram so on both sides uh, the okay he does not kill jehoram he kills jehoram's son okay joram joram is the name of the person um, uh, so um, ahaziah ahaziah is the name of the uh, king on the um, the the son of jehoram so he kills ahaziah the king of juda and he kills joram the king of northern israel jehu kills both the kings so basically what happens now is that there is no king on the throne of the northern kingdom there is no king on the throne of the southern kingdom and so here in the southern kingdom basically uh, uh, you know ah ah ahaziah is now dead and his mother atalaya you know the one who married uh, jehoram she decides that she wants to be on the throne and so now she takes a decision we see all of this um in second kings chapter 11 where it says that she decides to murder all her grandchildren because he, she doesn't want any of them to climb on to the throne she decides that she would like to sit on the throne and so she has all her own grandsons murdered so that she can ascend to the throne that is the kind of person that she is you know the kind of evil person that she is and um, this is the background that we get from kings so when we come to second chronicles chapter 23 that is where you have the story of uh, joash you know being mentioned exactly who is joash among all these grandsons who are being murdered you know by atalaya among all of them the last grandson is actually joash at that time he's still a still he's just a small baby he's still a one year old baby and 
so when she's having all the grandsons murdered, um, the his uh, her her daughter decides to save this little child. So uh, she is not like her mother. She she becomes a godly person because she marries a priest named Jehoiada. Okay, so Atalaya is evil. Atalaya, uh, you know, wants to murder her grandsons and ascend the throne. But her daughter is a godly person because she has married a priest named Jehoiada. And so uh, she and Jehoiada, they decide to adopt this little, you know, uh, baby Joash and protect him. And so Joash basically grows up in the temple complex. You know, the temple consisted, of course, of, of course, of the main temple buildings. You know, you have the holy place, the most holy place. You have the courtyard where you have the altar. You have That's the main temple area. Around this main temple area, you have many other buildings. You have the quarters where the priests are living. You have storage places where all the grain, you know, which is brought as tithes, all that grain is stored. You have uh, you have rooms where they, they store, uh, you know, on the utensils which are used for the sacrifices. So you have a whole bunch of other buildings which are around the actual temple building. And so this entire thing is basically called a temple complex. So uh, Jehoiada and his wife, they protect Joash from being murdered by Atalaya and they bring up this boy like as if he's their own child. You know, so um, and so finally when he's six years old, then they decide it's the right time to do the coronation ceremony, you know, where he will be declared as the rightful king. So Atalaya has been sitting on the throne for about five years now. And now, you know, in God's timing, Jehoiada, he takes the help of some of the temple guards and with their assistance and with some of the faithful people who have, you know, continued to stay faithful along with their support, they take this young child to the temple to you know, coronate him as the king and to establish him on the throne. So in uh, Second Chronicles chapter twenty-three, we see that they you know appoint him as king. And when the celebration is going on, Atalaya hears the noise of the celebration and she comes over there to find out what's going on. And when she gets to know that one of her grandchildren is still alive that Joash is alive and now he's been appointed as the king. She is very, very upset. And then uh, she tries to, uh, you know, escape, but then they capture her and she's killed. Uh, so um, once Atalaya is killed, um, now Joash is, you know, safe on the throne. Uh, so he becomes the king under the guardianship of Jehoiada, the priest who brings him up in godly ways. And Jehoiada and Joash together, they do extensive repair work on the temple. They try to restore you know, all the um, sacrifices which were being neglected up to that time. So there's a kind of uh, spiritual revival which is brought about in the land through Jehoiada, the priest, and Joash, you know, who is now gr growing up. Um, so as long as... Jehoiada, the priest, is alive, Joash stays faithful to the Lord. But once Jehoiada, the priest, dies, he goes back into idol worship, which basically brings out one basic truth. You see, he never really had any transformation on the inside. Just because a godly person was, you know, um, advising him and, you know, uh, mentoring him and helping him from the outside, he continued to be good as long as that godly influence was there. But once that godly influence was removed, once the priest died, uh, we see that uh, Joash goes off into idol worship. He backslides. So it is easy for us to be very, very spiritual when we are in a godly atmosphere, in a godly environment, where we have, you know, um, uh, people who are able to mentor us and disciple us and talk to us. But are we just relying upon the external environment to stay godly? Or on a daily basis, are we building our own personal relationship with the Lord? That is very, very important. 
know, to use an example, you know, all of us who are here in the Bible College, it's very easy to be spiritual in the Bible College because we have teachers who are constantly, you know, advising us, guiding us. We have times of prayer. We have times of, you know, worship. We are in a very godly environment. It is easy to be spiritual when the environment around us is, uh, you know, compatible. But what will happen tomorrow when you go back to your own places? When there is nobody, you know, guiding you and telling you, you know, let's have a time of prayer. Oh, let's have one day of fasting. You know, you know let's spend some time together discussing the Bible. What, if, what will happen on that day when you go back and you are no longer in a godly environment? At that time, have you become strong enough on the inside to remain in the Lord? If you have been building up your own personal relationship with the Lord during this time, when you go back, you'll be strong enough on the inside to continue living in the Lord, even if the environment around you is no longer good, because you have built yourself up on the inside. Joash did not do that. As long as Jehoiada was there to you know, uh, guide him and lead him, he stayed faithful to the Lord. But the minute that godly influence was removed, there was nothing on the inside. He had not bothered to build himself up in the Lord. And so he fell away. He backslid. And you know, uh, um, so Jehoiada's son, who has now become the priest, you know, his name is Zechariah, in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Zechariah comes to, uh, to Joash and he says, what you are doing is not good. The Lord is not pleased with the way you have gone into idolatry. Now let's remember who Zechariah is. Joash grew up in the home of Jehoiada and his wife. They brought him up from childhood. They in fact saved his life because he would have been killed uh, by Ataliah if they had not rescued him when he was a baby. So he grew up in the home of Jehoiada, which means he would have literally grown up along with Zechariah. They would almost be like brothers in the same house, you know. And now, when he's a grown-up man, Zechariah comes to him and says, what you have done, what you have, what you're doing by going back into idolatry, it is not honorable to the Lord. And what is Joash's response? He actually has Zechariah murdered. I mean, there is no gratitude at all for what Jehoiada and his family did for him. We see this in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 24. Um, maybe we can actually read out these verses. Uh, so uh, Second Chronicles chapter 24, if we can have someone read out for us, verses 20 to 25, all the way from 20 up to 25. Second Chronicles chapter 24. Verses 20 to 25. In the spring of the year, the Aramean army marched against Joash. They invaded Judah and Jerusalem. Um, maybe Second Chronicles 24? Because 23. Second uh, Chronicles 24, uh, verses 20 to 25. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. That was how King Joash repaid Jehoiada for his loyalty by killing his son. Zechariah's last words as he died were, May the Lord see what they are doing and avenge my death. In the spring of the year, the Aramean army marched against Joash. They invaded Judah okay, and uh, no, yeah, No, no, no. Um, yeah. I actually wanted verses 20 up to 20. Um, Okay, uh, fine. It, 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 it's all right. Uh, we, we actually got the main portion. Uh, you know, in verse 20, you have the warning being given uh, by Zechariah, who, when he says, Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper because you have forsaken the Lord, He has forsaken you. And uh, um, um, the king Joash is not pleased with this. And so he plots against. Um, Zechariah and Zechariah is stoned to death in the courtyard of the temple. The very temple complex where he grew up, the very temple complex where he had been shown, show, shown so much mercy by Jehoiada, you know, in that same place, he has 
uh, Zechariah murdered. And so it says over here in verse 22, Second Chronicles uh, uh, chapter 24, verse 22, it says, King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father Jehoiada had shown him, but killed his son. And so Zechariah, when he's dying, he says, may the Lord see this and call you to account. Okay, so um, Zechariah says, you know, may the Lord punish you for what you have done. You know, and so we see that later on, uh, when the Aramean army, uh, yeah, which is what, uh, you know, Anusha was reading out, when the Aramean, Aramean army comes to fight against Joash, uh, he's very severely wounded in the battle. And then later on, he's assassinated by uh, some officials of his. Okay, so Joash, even though his life was saved in a miraculous way, even though he grew up in such a godly environment, his life did not go well. On the other hand, you have Josiah, who is um, mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter 34. We see a great contrast between these two men. Josiah also comes to the throne when he's very, very young. Joash, if you remember, he was coronated as king at the age of six. On the other hand, Josiah, when, when did he become king? His father is assassinated. So when uh, jo Josiah's father is assassinated, he comes to the throne at the age of eight. Okay, so he's just an eight-year-old boy when he becomes the king. But look at the way that Josiah develops himself spiritually. Um, if someone could read out Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 3. Uh, maybe verse 3 should be enough. Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 3. Yeah, if you if you could read out. Second Chronicles 34, verse 3. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. Then in the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asherah poles, and the carved idols and cast images. It says over here that unlike Joash, who never bothered to really grow in God, here we see Josiah, at the age of eight, he came to the throne. At the age of 16, eight years later, at the age of 16, which is what in today's terminology, um, it would be a person maybe who has just, you know, is maybe in the 11th standard, 12th standard. At that age, he begins to seriously seek the God of, you know, uh, of his father, David, it says. And when he's 20 years old, he starts purifying that entire region. He starts breaking down all the temples which have been built. He starts removing all the idols which have, you know, been um, established in all these places in around in and in and in and around Judah and Jerusalem. So here is a man who is passionate for the things of God. And then it goes on to say that not only is he trying to, you know, straighten up and purify Judah, he even wants to go into the go into the Israelite region and um, break down the idols over there. It's not enough for him that only Judah should follow the Yahweh. He wants even the northern Israelite people to also follow uh, Yahweh. That is his passion. So here is a man who's basically doing uh, Old Testament evangelism. He's literally going from place to place, you know, and uh, he's sending out officials and priests and Levites to teach the people the things of God. So he was highly committed to the Lord. And why was he able to go into the northern kingdom and break down the idols over there? Because you see, it's, uh, in the time of his grandfather, Hezekiah, is basically when the Assyrians come and they conquer the northern people and take them away into slavery. So uh, at this time, the northern kingdom is again back with the southern kingdom. Okay, because the, the, the region which was, uh, you know, the... The northern uh, territories are now back under the control of the southern kingdom simply because the king has been removed. The Assyrians came and conquered the northern kingdom and took away the, most of the people as slaves. So those who are left behind, who, have, who are still continuing in Jeroboam's idolatry, he chooses to go into all those regions and try to bring even those people back to the Lord. And so it says in Second Chronicles 34 verse 6, 
in the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars, you know, and he uh, tries to bring even those people back to Yahweh. All this he is doing at the age of 20. You know, he is passionate for the Lord. And then it says, when he was 26 years old, he starts to again do a lot of repair work that was, that was you know, pending for the temple. Have you noticed again and again they need to do repair work on the temple? What does it tell us about the people? It tells that they are neglecting the temple of God so much that it actually needs repair work from time to time. Um, they are so busy following pagan idols that they are not even focusing on Yahweh and the things of Yahweh. That's the level of backsliding that's going on in the land. And so um, after the time of Jehoiada, when he had done repair work, after that, nobody had bothered to do anything for the temple. And so now Joash, uh, 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 Josiah, sorry, jo Josiah now takes the effort to again do, you know, to clean up the temple premises and repair the temple and all of that. And while he is doing that, he discovers a book of the law that is mentioned in your uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 14 onwards. Uh, maybe we can have uh, you know someone read out Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 14 and 15. Yeah, Second Chronicles 34, 14 and 15, please. Can I read, sister? Go ahead, yeah. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book of Shaphan. So when he's doing the repair works, they find a scroll of the Torah, you know, the first five books. And when he starts reading it, he realizes that, you know, he has not kept many of the laws of the Lord. He was not even aware of them. Whatever little bit he knew, he was honestly following that. And he was being sincere in following the Lord. But there are so many things which he was not even aware of. And so it says in verse 19, when he, when he heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. He was very, very repentant. And he realized that even though he had been trying so hard to be a godly person, what he had been doing was not enough. And there are so, much, so many more things which God had actually ordered the people to follow. So look at the heart of this man. Even though he was, he did not really have a full copy of the Torah. Whatever little bit he knew about the Lord, he decided to seek the God of his father David, and he and it says that he began to, you know, take care of uh, reformation work. He did a lot of repairs. He did all that, and now when he's when he when when, when the law of Moses is read out to him, and he discovers that he has not kept many of those laws, his attitude is not, oh, I've done enough. Okay, I did not know about all these laws, but I've already done enough for the Lord. That was not his attitude. He tears his robes and he immediately goes to a prophetess named Hulda, which is mentioned in your verse 22. He approaches Hulda and he asks, what should we do? We have not kept the law of the Lord in the way it's supposed to be kept. We only found out now after the scroll was, you know, accidentally discovered. It shows how much the people had gone into idolatry that they did not even have a, have a copy of the scroll. Imagine. And now when they have discovered the scroll, it's like a new discovery for them, which means for centuries, people have not even been bothering to learn what the law of Moses has taught. There was serious backsliding going on in the entire nation. So we see um, Josiah coming to prophetess Hulda and asking what to, what do we do now because we have not been sincere in obeying the Lord and this is what Hulda the prophetess says um, you know uh, this is the message which she conveys to uh, to the king Josiah 
uh, if we can in the same chapter chapter 34 itself um, if someone could read out for us uh, verses 23 and uh, maybe 23 up to verse 27 yeah 23 to 27 if you could read out please Can I read, Pastor? Yeah, go ahead, please. She said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Go back and tell the man who sent you. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this city and its people. All the curses written in the scroll that was read to the king of Judah will come true. For my people have abandoned me and offered sacrifice to pagan gods, and I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will be poured out on this place, and it will not be quenched. But go to the king of Judah, who sent you to seek the Lord, and tell him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you have just heard. You, uh, you were, you are sorry and humbled yourself before God when you heard His words against this city and its people. You humbled yourself and tore your clothing in despair and wept before Me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. Okay, so the law, uh, the, the this the message which the prophetess conveys to Josiah. Um, the Lord says, because you have humbled yourself and repented, even though, yes, judgment is going to come upon Judah, it will not happen during your time. Your eyes will not see the destruction. You will be able to, you know, uh, live in peace. So, when we are godly, when we are following the Lord, when we are doing our best to obey Him, what should be our response when God brings correction? When he points out things in our life which are still not pleasing, we can have two attitudes. We can say, oh, I've done so much for the Lord. So it's all right. You know, God will excuse me. That could be one attitude. On the other hand, we can be like this man, Josiah. He didn't boast and say, oh, I went all the way to northern Israel and I tore down the temples over there. It's okay, no, I didn't know about this loss in the scroll, so it's not my fault. That was not his attitude. He immediately humbled himself. He tore his robes. In fact, he went to a prophetess and inquired of the Lord and said, What do we do? How do we repent? Teach us. We want to know. And the Lord says, Because of the attitude which you have, I will see to it that even though judgment is coming upon the land, it will not happen during your time. And so it is... Uh, this, we see a great contrast between Joash, who had nothing on the inside. On the, uh, on the other hand, we have Josiah, who is constantly building himself up in the Lord. And when God points out his mistakes to him, he humbles himself and he's willing to repent further. So, um, uh, so you know, we need to be like this second king, like Josiah rather than Joash. Uh, so, uh, just as God promises, uh, the judgment does not come upon Judah in the time of um, Josiah. It comes later on in the time of Jehoiakim. So three times Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes away people as captive. The very first time that Nebuchadnezzar comes and attacks, that is in 605 BC. So when he comes for the first time, he takes away Jehoiakim, the king. And during that time, he also takes away Daniel. Okay, so during the very first attack, Daniel, the king Jehoiakim, Kim, and others are taken away. The second time that Nebuchadnezzar attacks, that would be in 597 BC. So the second time when he comes, the king is now Jehoiakim. Okay, the first one was Jehoiakim. This is Jehoiakim. So the second time he comes, he takes away Jehoiakim. And this time, he, uh, Ezekiel is also taken away as a slave. And the third time, of course, is in 586 BC. Um, so, uh, yeah, these are just some details that we could very briefly go through uh, from the book of Chronicles. So when we come back from the break, 
uh, we look at Ezra and Nehemiah. All right, yeah, thank you.